Welcome. This video was produced in January and February of 2020. It's a celebration of an 18-year-old young man who lived in a very tumultuous and epic time in our country's history and documented those experiences in a short but eloquent diary. This young man happened to live in a small town in the middle of the beautiful Cumberland Valley. He was from sturdy, hard-working Pennsylvania German ancestry. He happened to be an 18-year-old apprentice when he made a courageous decision to enlist in the Union Army during one of the most bloody conflicts in human history, America's Civil War. Also, this young man happened to be my grandfather's grandfather. His name was Edgar Albert Walters. This video is also an outcome of the love that my brother and I have for our father and mother who raised us and their parents and so on. My brother and I know that we came from a long line of decent, honest, and hardworking people because our fathers preserved and shared our family's history. I want to show now the line of men from David and I through our paternal line directly to Edgar, the Civil War veteran, to provide context that explains our feelings of profound pride, gratitude, and love for our family. My older brother, David Scott Walters, is currently 59, and I, Timothy Allen Walters, am 57, about to turn 58. We were both born in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Our father, Ronald Frederick Walters, was born in Harrisburg, PA, and was 60 when he died in 1997. Our mother, Patricia Lee White Walters, was born in Tyrone, Pennsylvania, and was 69 when she passed in 2010. Our grandfather, George Frederick Walters, was born in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, and passed at the age of 62 in 1973. Our grandmother, Beatrice Laurel Davenport Walters, was born in Cozad, Nebraska, and was 103 when she passed in 2015. Our great-grandfather, Frederick Luther Walters, was born in Shippensburg, Pennsylvania, and was 61 when he passed in 1947. Our great-grandmother, Myrtle Susan Kessler Walters, was born in Blaine, Pennsylvania, and was 67 when she passed. And finally, our great-great-grandfather, Edgar Albert Walters, the Civil War veteran, was born in Shippensburg, Pennsylvania, and was 40 years old when he passed in 1887. Our great-great-grandmother, Edgar's wife, Elmira E. Stumball Walters, was 71 when she passed. Please note that her older brother was Colonel Frederick Shearer Stumball, commander of the 77th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry, and that unit was victorious under his leadership at the Battle of Shiloh. This video is dedicated to our father Ronald and his father George, two men that were custodians and researchers of their family history preserving and sharing that history so that the excellent family legacy can continue to inspire future generations. Please enjoy. Off to the war, a year in the ranks. From the very beginning of the Rebel Lion, I felt a strong desire to enter the army I attribute this feeling to various causes, in part perhaps to a curiosity regarding the life of a soldier, in part to a strong martial feeling, engendered by reading the histories of the battles and sieges and victories of the mighty warriors of past ages, and lastly, I trust mostly to a sincere patriotic feeling aroused to quicker life by the dangers with which our country was threatened. Owing to the strictness with which our military officers enlisted men, during the first two or three years of the war it was exceedingly difficult for a youth who did not come up to the prescribed military standard to enter the ranks. This may have been, and doubtless was the correct system at the time, 
But when the climate of war grew thicker and darker, and the fearful fray raged bloodier and more intensely, necessity became more imperious than choice, and physical ability to carry a knapsack became a greater consideration in the eyes of the enrolling officers than a fixed age. It was not until the summer of 1864, the year immediately preceding the close of the war, that an opportunity, which I considered feasible, offered itself of fulfilling my wishes. True, many young men of my age had enlisted previous to this, but as I was an apprentice at the time, and a constant espionage was kept over me by both parents and employer, it was a matter of extreme difficulty for me to elude their vigilance. At length, a proclamation was issued by President Lincoln for volunteers for 100 days for the purpose of guarding fortifications in and around the city of Washington and also other points. I conceived that this would be an excellent opportunity for me to experiment on the relative comforts and discomforts of soldiering and accordingly on being requested to accompany a young acquaintance to Harrisburg and enlist in one of those regiments without making any other preliminary arrangements or informing any one of my intention, I gladly agreed. On the 18th of July, myself and companion took to the cars at Shippensburg. On our way to the rendezvous, I know I had some strange sensations as the train moved slowly away. I was taking a new step into the future, one hitherto untried by me, and from which, once taken, there could be no retrogression. It was in opposition to the wishes and entirely without the knowledge of all my friends. But as the motion of the cars grew swifter, these thoughts soon left me, and my blood bounded quickly through the, my veins at the thought that at last the darling hope was about to be realized, and that soon my name could be enrolled with those of the thousands of brave men battling for our rights. At Carlisle, a party of young men entered the cars on the same mission with, their, with ourselves. Some of them were also runaway apprentices and recounted their adventures in dodging their bosses with great gusto, perhaps to keep their spirits up. About the middle of the afternoon, we arrived at the city of Harrisburg, the great rendezvous of the Pennsylvania soldiers during the war. The streets were full of soldiers, officers and privates, some glittering in new and flashing uniforms, others whose tattered blues and bronzed faces gave evidence that they had seen long and arduous service. The corners were placarded with huge bills calling for volunteers, substitutes, and etc. Each one extolling the merits of its particular officers or company in glowing terms. A number of accommodating gents in citizens clothing came up to us and commenced in admirable and astonishing strains to inform us of high bounties, splendid officers, and similar advantages which they could obtain for us. But we cut their eloquent appeals short by abruptly leaving them and traveling on towards Camp Curtin, passing the State House on Capitol Hill with its huge dome in our way. There were about 1,800 or 2,000 men in camp at that time. Some of the companies had already been filled up and mustered in, but the majority of them had not yet the requisite number of men and were recruiting. We did not join any of them that evening, but contented ourselves with strolling about the camp for a couple of hours and then returning to town. We stayed that night at the park house and the next morning went out to camp again, where we were fortunate enough to meet with an acquaintance of ours who had already enlisted and at once concluded to join his company. They then lacked but a few men and succeeded in getting them during the day. In the evening we were sworn in and received a bounty of sixty dollars each, and on that night I enjoyed for the first time the luxury of sleeping in a tent with but a blanket between me and the ground. I cannot say that I particularly relished it, 
but I soon learned to sleep as comfortably and soundly in that position as in the softest bed. The company in which I enlisted was mainly from Columbia, Lancaster County. They were jovial, sociable fellows, and I was soon pretty well acquainted among them. Our company officers were as follows. Captain Thomas H. Caldwell, First Lieutenant John Thomas, and Second Lieutenant James Halderman. We passed the remainder of the week principally in camp, although as there was not a very strict guard, we occasionally walked into town. We were quartered in the large A tents and messed together, four or five in each, quite comfortably. I suppose one experience here was about like that of all new soldiers, the new and constantly changing scenes and freedom of camp yet undisciplined conspired to make us think it was a perfectly glorious and it was the same with the majority of the men. Our rations were good and very abundant, owing partly to the fact that as no complete records of the men in camp was yet made up, many extra rations were drawn. On the 20th we drew our uniforms, and by the way, they were composed of the most miserable shoddy that ever a villainous contractor palmed off on the government. Not a month had elapsed before the half of them were absolutely in rags, my own included in the number. Our headgear consisted of that very symmetrical article known as the forage cap, and our feet were encased in various sizes of leather articles, calculated for shoes, ranging from number 10 to 13, so that as it may be imagined, the personal appearance of most of us was not particularly enhanced. However, we were at least in uniform and considered that ample satisfaction to offset the non-attractiveness of our dress. On the 22nd, we drew arms and accoutrements. Our rifles were of the Springfield pattern and had been in serviceable had been in service before, although most of them were in very good condition. We then commenced the squad drill, and the manual of arms was performed by us with certainly ver every conceivable variation that green soldiers could give it. Among the novelties which I witnessed while there was a company of genuine Indians who had been attached to a Wisconsin regiment and were then returning to their native place from the Army of the Potomac. They were tall, powerful men and looked as if fully able to sustain the reputation of their race for warlike prowess. I was now quite anxious to visit home before leaving for the front, which we daily expected to do, but it was impossible to obtain a leave of absence on account of a great many of the men being already away so I determined to undertake it on my own responsibility. Accordingly, on the 23rd, I went into Harrisburg, took the Cumberland Valley train, and reached my destination, unchallenged by any guards. I was quite successful in getting my friends and family reconciled to my enlistment, owing, I have no doubt, to the fact that it was too late to prevent it. I remained there over Sunday, and on Monday morning, after a couple of hours ride down our beautiful valley, again arrived at Harrisburg. My spirits were considerably depressed on finding that our regiment had left the evening before for the south and were in no wise elevated when, I, when a provost guard came along and offered his services as my escort to the marshal's office without any invitation whatever. This was about my first experience of military discipline and did not seem to me to be a very attractive business. However, the marshal released me from guard and bid me report immediately to the commandant at Camp Curtin. I did so and there found a sergeant and three or four men who were also left behind. My gun and baggage were there in perfectly good order and my spirits went up to their ordinary standard. I learned from them that the regiment had been organized the day before and drew ammunition and shelter tents leaving the for Baltimore the previous evening. We went in about noon to the soldiers rest where a couple of hundred others were in the same predicament as myself awaiting transportation. 
The Soldiers' Rest was a very large building fitted up by the government for the accommodation of soldiers passing through the city. A large dining room was attached and 1,000 men could readily have eaten at one time. The fare consisted of boiled pork, bread, and coffee and could be had at any hour of the day or night and about a score of colored waiters were in constant attendance. We remained there until about 7 o'clock the next morning when we took to the cars for Baltimore. The scenery along the road was very picturesque and I enjoyed it very much. For a while we kept along the banks of the broad Susquehanna which spread out between its green banks like a blue mirror broken here and there by the little islands covering the foliage to the water's edge. The only town of any considerable size that the road passes through is York, where the most notable feature that I could observe was an abundance of hucksters and pie women who make the air ring with their outcries. We passed Cockeysville and the Riley House, noted for their prominence at the beginning of the war, and about noon whirled into the great city of Baltimore. We slung our knapsacks and marched out through hot and dusty streets directly north into the country. We got a very limited view of the place and there was nothing worth noting in the streets through which we passed. We marched about four miles and this was our first trial. The load began to feel uncomfortably heavy when all at once we came upon our regiment and camped in the woods. It was a very short time finding my companions and they were rejoiced to see me as they had feared I would have some trouble in reaching them. Our camp there was very pleasantly situated in the midst of the woods about three-fourths of a mile from Woodbury Station on the Northern Central Railroad. About 10,000 men were encamped there at this time from different states. At Woodbury there were our large cotton factories and hundreds of young girls were employed in them. A party of us tried to gain admission to one of them to see the machinery in operation, but it was contrary to the regulations and consequently we had to forego it. I then learned for the first time the details of our regimental organization. Ours was Company E of the 195th PV, William L. Bear, Major Oliver T. James, and Adjunct H. P. Case. As I had not been present when the tents were issued, and none was saved for me, I was compl compelled to do without, which at any other season of the year would have been a serious inconvenience. But the weather was warm, and three of us lay in a tent open at both ends, quite comfortably. We were informed that there was a large park about a mile from camp extending in towards the city, and a party of us walked over one day and found ourselves well repaid for the tramp. It is a delightful place covered with grass and flowers and shrubbery, well shaded and cut up into broad avenues, making a splendid afternoon's drive for the city residents. Hacks and omnibuses ran constantly from and to the city and numbers of people were strolling through its shady retreats. We wandered around a while and came to a little grotto with a beautiful spring neatly walled up and ornamented with stone urns and columns. After drinking from its cool waters, we returned to camp with spirits invigorated by the lovely, lovely scenery which art and nature combined to contribute. On the night of the 29th, as we were at roll call, the orders came to strike tents and pack up ready for marching. The scene following rivaled pandemonium and defies any description. The men seemed to turn perfectly wild and tore tents down, built huge fires of the rubbish, howling all the time like maniacs. This is another of the peculiarities of new troops. They lose all control of themselves in the excitement and seem scarcely to know what they are doing. However, as we had to wait until about midnight before starting, their ardor was partially cooled off by that time. We marched directly into the city through some of the principal streets and lofty spires, monuments, and domes loomed above us in the darkness as we moved along, but none of us were acquainted with any of the buildings we passed. We halted at the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Depot, stacked arms, piled up our knapsacks, placed guards over them, and passed into the soldiers rest close for refreshments. This was a place similar to that in Harrisburg, though much larger. We slept that night in the street, and I never enjoyed a night's rest better than I did there on the hard paved streets of Baltimore. 
The circumstance which was most inconvenient to us was the miserably poor water which we got there. It was so offensive to the smell and taste as to render it almost impossible to drink it. If all Baltimore is supplied with such water the whole summer season, it should not wonder if its inhabitants would look out for some agreeable substitute. In the morning, we took the cars and caught a glimpse of the bay with its numerous shipping craft as we moved along. We stopped at the Relay House, nine miles south of the city, the point where the Washington and Harper's Ferry branches of the road form a junction. We encamped in a field close by where the sun beat down with terrible force. We soon found a fine spring of cold water after our late experience tasted delicious as the nectar of the Grecian gods could have done. That evening we reached the appalling news of the burning of Chambersburg. This was coming more nearly to our homes than any previous event of the war and filled us with apprehensions for the safety of our own native places. The men were so exasperated that, I think, a war of extermination would have been fully endorsed by nearly every man in the regiment. There is a very fine viaduct across the Patasco River at this place over which the Washington Road passes. The arches are high and compactly built of stone, and a small monument at the end records the name of the architect with the time of its erection. On the morning of the next day, the 31st of July, after drawing 20 additional rounds of cartridges, which with those already received made 80, and three days rations of crackers, the first we had drawn, we took the train together with a battery of artillery and started out on the road to Harper's Ferry. The road winds crookedly along the course of the Patapsco, passing elegant mills with its large factories and a number of unimportant places in a terribly wild country, but abounding in fine scenery. At one station, we saw a Maryland 100 Days Regiment, who had been in the late battle at Monocacy Junction between our forces and the rebel General Early. We reached the junction five miles from Frederick in the evening and encamped close by the Monocacy River directly on the battlefield. The next morning, after eating my breakfast, I walked out over the battlefield. The battle had been fought about three weeks before, and with the exception that the dead had been buried, the field was in about the same condition as it had been in at the close of the conflict. Considering the numbers engaged, the fight had been quite a severe one of which fact there are yet remained ample evidence. I walked up first to the hill on which the rebel artillery was planted. While their heavy masses of infantry were driving our forces, who were far outnumbered, slowly along. From this position they shelled and destroyed two blockhouses in the opposite, or north, side of the railroad, killing quite a number of our men. Along the top of this hill they had buried most of their dead, and I think there were about a hundred graves, each with a neat headboard, with the name of its occupant and his company and regiment. The majority of them were Georgian artillerists and had been picked off by our sharpshooters. About 400 or 500 yards south stood a large and splendid farmhouse with a beautiful and well-shaded lawn stretching down in front of it. In this house, some of our sharpshooters had been stationed and the roof and walls had numbers of large holes piercing in them from the guns of the enemy. Large numbers of rifle barrels, broken rifles, knapsacks, and everything pertaining to a soldier's outfit were strewn over the battlefield in every direction. Across the railroad, about three-eighths of a mile, the greater part of our men were buried. A rifle pit into which they had been thrown together and covered by the rebels formed their common grave. Some, however, were buried as they fell in different parts of the field, and I noticed the grave of a New York captain on the edge of the hill, between the lines, and but a short distance from the rebel position. As I stood by the pit in which our men had been rudely thrown together, I could not help thinking that thought they were dead, and their names unknown to the thousands around them, yet in coming ages the record of their heroic deeds will be embalmed green and never fading in the memory of restored and reunited country. Here then is their reward. While generation after generation will pass away and be forgotten, their names will shine with an eternal luster which time will only intensify. 
A strong army soon concentrated here. The 6th Corps of the Army of the Potomac and part of the 19th Corps from Banks' Louisiana Army, together with many of the other troops of every arm of service, were brought together here under the immediate command of General Hunter. Among other regiments was the 3rd Pennsylvania Cavalry, with a number of those members I was acquainted. My first experience on picket was at a ford on the Monocacy River, about three miles from camp, where a major road to Frederick crossed. We were out 24 hours, and the only enemies who made their appearance were mosquitoes, who attacked us by myriads, and almost strong enough to carry us away bodily. I think I never passed before such a horrible night. It was impossible to sleep, and almost impossible to stay awake, with the poisonous sting of their numerous bites. Morning came at last, however, and with it a partial relief from those insufferable annoyances. Immediately before General Sheridan's accession to command, our army was visited by General Grant. He remained at General Hunter's headquarters for several hours, and I succeeded in obtaining a very good view of the great chieftain, and also his daughter, Mrs. Ricketts, who accompanied him. His uniform was simple, the only insignia of his rank being the three stars on his shoulders. We practiced battalion and company drill and the manual of arms daily and soon became quite familiar with them. Many of the boys were quite zealous at first and took very every opportunity of drilling, but the novelty of it soon worn away and it came to be looked upon as more of a duty than a privilege, at least with the majority. Our daily routine, routine of roll calls, guard mounts, and drills, together with the occasional variation of inspections, going on picket, and etc., soon became quite natural to us, and a day in camp without them would have seemed as odd as one at home with them. Our encampment was at first on the south side of the railroad, but a heavy rain came up one afternoon about the middle of August, and the ground being low, our camp was completely flooded. On the next day, we moved across the road on the top of the hill, where we could be more secure from any other misfortune of the kind. 